All right. Well, this podcast season series that we are doing is one that um, just presented itself to us based on the unexpected events that were going on inside of the Organized 365 team. And I am so grateful that, that so many of them have willingly come on the podcast to share because I think that what we experience inside of the company and then as individual people is experienced by everyone every single day, but we just don't talk about these things. So if you don't talk about them, then how do you know how to support and how do you know how to process through unexpected events, positive or negative? So just to catch you up to speed, we have Monique, family of eight, regular unexpected events all the time, good, bad, and different. And then in the second podcast episode, we talked about Alina being unresponsive and, you know, that they are still walking through that unexpected event. But that was the first of the unexpected events that I actually knew about as a business owner and started to orchestrate and change the events that we were attending <clears throat> as an organized 365 team. So in order to replace Monique in the South Carolina event and replace Virginia, which you'll hear about Virginia, why she had to um, hop out in the next podcast, we added Steph in, but then you heard in the last podcast how Steph got added in and taken right back out before the um, South Carolina event even happened. So luckily we had also added Tanya. So Steph had said, you should add Tanya to this event as well. And this is before I knew that Virginia wasn't going to be at the South Carolina event. So at the time we were driving and flying and getting to the South Carolina event, Tanya and I knew that we both were going to be at this event the entire time. We were crossing our fingers that Monique was going to be able to come in and do the certification part. But if she didn't, Tanya was prepared to do that as well. So Tanya, um, thanks for joining in at the last minute. You, I mean, you had done live events with us before. It wasn't like you didn't know how to do paper organizer retreat. You're a, a, a trained, certified organizer. You've done events. We just pulled you in at the last minute and you said, yes, I'll go. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm always happy to jump in and help where I can. And when we planned, <laughs> just in my defense, when we planned the South Carolina um homeschool conference, you were still living in North Carolina. I didn't realize you would be moving to Florida, which we've covered in a different podcast. You proactively decided to move to Florida um, so that you and your in-laws could go from two houses down to one. And as long as you were going down to one, you wanted to live in the state of Florida. So you found a house, you moved. We've done a whole podcast about that. You guys can go find that one. Um, I'm sure we'll link it in the show notes, but you moved down there, you sold both houses, you merged all the furniture and your plan was that, you know, long in the future, when needed, you would already have only one household when you needed to care for your husband's parents. And then what happened? <laughs> um, so we moved in January of 2023 and, um, my mother-in-law, started, you know, going to all the new doctors. So she went to see all of her, all of the specialists and everything to kind of like get acclimated to this area and, and find all the providers that she needed. And during that um, experience, um, there were a lot of blood tests and, you know, everything that happens when you get new providers. So, um, and then she wasn't feeling so well. And by the 1st of May, she was being sent to the ER um, and they decided that she needed to have a heart cath. So during that procedure, um, she figured out that she needed extensive surgery and went directly to surgery. So uh, we're gonna catch up on that one later. We're gonna go back now to March when you've agreed to substitute for the substitutes at the homeschool and paper organizing retreat. At this point, I was like, look, we don't have to do the booth. We don't need to do the homeschool booth. I will go and I will speak because I mean, I'm, I'm in the printed agenda. If people want to hear me speak, I'm already going to be in South Carolina. I can go speak. Um, and then you and I, or you and Monique or whoever can run the paper organizing retreat and the certification. Like we can't not do the certification. We could not do the homeschool event. Like this is where I was in my determination. So you say yes. And then what happens at home before you even get to South Carolina, which I just found out about today, by the way. Um, 
So I forgot. I yeah, I jumped ahead a little bit. So um, on I was scheduled to fly out on Thursday to come to Greenville for the paper organizing retreat. And on Tuesday evening, my son was at football practice and fell. And when he came home, he was just like, my arm hurts. And so we were trying to determine like what, what the deal was. I gave him some, you know, um, pain medication and he seemed like he was okay. And then the next day he was really favorite, you know, he was babying his arm. And so I, I, I said, this is, this is not good. Like, I think he needs to go get seen. So, um, my husband sent him to the, um, took him to the ER because I was working. So I had to relinquish control over that, which was very difficult for me because I am generally the one who takes care of all of the medical needs for the family. Um, and so he took him to the ER, which was hours upon hours, as you can probably imagine. Um, and his arm was broken. So that was Wednesday. And on Thursday, I was supposed to leave to go to Greenville. So, and I mean, when of all the things that we're talking about in this podcast series, they're all like life or death. To me, broken arms, broken arm. I mean, kids are going to break up. I have never had a child break anything though. So easy for me to say, right? And I love how you said, you know, I'm the one that usually takes them to the ER and you didn't in this case because you were working. Um, and then your child has a broken arm and you're going to turn around and you're going to fly out on Thursday to help us with this paper organizing retreat and leave your child with a broken arm at home. Now, to be clear, the child's fine. Your, your spouse is fine. Like everybody's fine, but we, I don't know why we do this. I do this. You do this. Maybe not all do, but, but a lot of us women, we like internalize, like, I oh, should be the one sitting for hours on end in an ER with <laughs> just waiting for one x-ray. I should be the one that doesn't travel for work and just is home just in case anything needs to happen for this broken arm. Like, I don't know why we do this, but we do, don't we? Absolutely. Uh, 100%. <laughs> I was like, Oh my goodness. You know, I knew that I was still going to go to Greenville, but I, I just, I felt guilty, even though he was totally fine. Even, even though my husband is totally capable of, you know, taking him to a doctor and giving him pain medication if he needs it, all those things. But I just felt so guilty because I just wanted to be the one to take care of him. Um, so yeah, it was tough. It was tough. So another little side note, a couple of weeks prior, our bookkeeper, the only bookkeeper we've ever had, gave her notice. And so Organized 365 was without a bookkeeper, which, as you all know, you purchase everything online, which is a, a bazillion, million, trillion individual transactions that come in to the company that each have actions that need to be done. So Tanya was hired into Organize 365 for the Productive Home Solution and the education team. And I said, hey, you've been a controller. <laughs> you know what numbers are for. This is exactly exa exactly what I said. I said, um, do you remember when I was on Instagram and I was talking about the birds and the telephone pole? And you said, yes. I said, great. So you understand how I view Lisa Math and your controller. Would you mind stepping in just for a small period of time here, aka until we can figure out what we're doing and take over everything financial in the company? And you were like, sure. And I was like, great. So you and I were both thinking, great, when we get to South Carolina, not realizing it's only going to be us in South Carolina, we think there's going to be other people there. We're thinking, great, you will be there as support in case money can't come because Steph is definitely going to be there and they will actually run it. And you and I will actually work on the transitioning of the finances of the entire company while they run the event. And then in case you're needed, you'll just kind of support them. And that is not where we ended up. We ended up with it was going to be you and I. And if we were lucky, Monique was going to do the certification day. So we did get some time together while Monique was able to be there and do that one day before she left. And then I would be up in my hotel room work, trying to figure out how Lisa Math worked in real world math. And then I would come down the paper organizer retreat and I'd be like, Tanya, come here. And we would go and we would walk in circles for like 20 or 30 minutes while I processed through what we we're going to do. And then I, put you back into the paper organizing retreat because also at the same time, 
four weeks earlier, we found out that our website, which is completely custom coded, for some reason didn't have what's called schema, which apparently is a really big deal. And the SEO was failing on our website quickly. And that by the time we got to July, our website would not be ranking for any keywords at all. So this is March. We're talking about this in March. So we had hired someone to move our website. Our website was 4,000 pages, including the um, learn the dashboard that you guys use, 4,000 pages, all had to be manually moved. And I always knew they would have to be manually moved. This is why I never wanted to do this. The website developer did not think that was true until eight weeks into the job when she said, this is all going to be manually moved. I said, I know. That's why we've been working out for 12 weeks. And we had already, our team had already moved over 2,000 of them because nothing, there was no plugin. So in South Carolina, you and I are there running that event. And by that, I mean, you were running the event. <laughs> I was going and speaking in a monsoon of rain. We were trying to figure out how to finish moving the, the bookkeeper had finished her 30 days. So you and I were in charge of all the finances and we already know how much of a help I was based on what I just said. And we had decided that we were going to get go ahead and move the website, which was extremely expensive. And I knew it was going to be super, super hard because to move off of a custom site is almost impossible. And so I was in the hotel room figuring out which programs would work on a WordPress website and not crash when we moved over because I had done this before in our last website. And so when we would go on those walks, like we talked about getting rid of QuickBooks. We talked about getting rid of our inventory system. Like we were going to change all of the foundational systems in the company. And then I'd go back and I'd do more research and then I'd, I'd meet with you again. So a couple of things that happened in South Carolina. One, it was super, super helpful from a business owner and a manager perspective. Like if you're a business owner or a manager, sometimes it is really, really helpful to get in person with your remote staff so that you can problem solve, separate, problem solve. And so we did that a lot over the weekend. I found that we, you and I really did a lot about that, getting ready to sign the contract for the new website, realizing how much work we were putting on the team by doing that, the finances, figuring out how we were going to finance that, and then also figuring out how we were going to go from basically an analog bookkeeping system to a online bookkeeping system. Like we were paying most of our bills at that time with checks including things to the IRS. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it, we were solving some pretty big uh, organized 365 issues while running a live event. Yes. Yeah. It was fun though. Just, and just to be clear, we had no idea what we we're doing, neither of us, but we were ready to solve the problem. I, I was like, I remember so many times I'd be like, what do you think about this? Tanya, you're like, I'll look into it. I'll do it. Like, like that all the time. You're like, we'll figure it out. Like there is nothing that we figured we couldn't figure out. And it wasn't pretty, but we did figure out. So that was great. The other thing is all of these live events that um, Organize 365 does for the community. I found one of the biggest benefits is getting to spend so much time personally with the remote staff when we do these events. So um, you can get a lot out of remote events. Now on the flip side, you running the paper organizing retreat and not having Monique there and doing it on your own, you'd attend it and stuff. What was that like for you? Like, what was exciting about it? What was nerve wracking about it? What opportunities came from it? Um, I loved it. It was, it was fantastic. Um, actually, I'd never been to an in-person event before. <laughs> so, <laughs> details, was, details, Tanya, that's details. Yeah, that, was, that was interesting. Um, Whatever. But of course, as a certified organizer, I've I've held virtual paper organizing retreats, and I've I've done it many many times. But it was different being in a location, having to deal with you know the um, the staff of the hotel and all of the retreat attendees, and um, being able to be in person and just see the amount of work mm. that everyone brought and everything they got um through was amazing um you see it in photos or videos on your instagram but really being in person and seeing it is a is a different experience and um even getting to know a lot of the attendees 
they, you know, a lot of them knew me, knew my name, felt like we had met before sometimes. Um, and that was really cool to be able to talk to them and uh, get to know them a lot better in person, which was great. And running the event was fun. And I do always have like, um, okay, so here's a little thing. I have like a little fear of public speaking. So um, <laughs> I guess we got over that, didn't we? <laughs> so being able to be in person and have to just do it uh, really helped with that, I think. Well, and you know, in hindsight, I I don't know what it is about my personality. I don't want the team to need to do things that are out of their comfort zone or that would benefit me over them. Like I'm very careful that I don't take from family time, that I don't, you know, require things that you shouldn't as an employer, especially since I've grown my company kind of like you know, just with people that kind of come alongside and we we grow it, but it, it's a company. Like you get a paycheck, there's benefits, there's HR. We have HR now. And so I'm really trying to be mindful of, I think we're friends, but also I'm your boss. So it's not actually the same thing. Um, And while you very willingly came and helped at the paper organizer retreat, I mean, you were, you were supposed to the year before anyway. It wasn't like you were like a non-traveling employee. You were a traveling employee. But in hindsight, you got a lot of benefits and opportunities because of the situation you were put in that I would not have naturally been like, okay, so we're going to do this paper organizing retreat and Tanya's going to run it. Like, no, it was always going to be Monique was going to run whatever and whoever was going to support her. But then when those uh, automatic go-to people are taken out for whatever reason, you were nominated by Steph to come to this event and then by attrition, you ended up running the event. As an employee and as a manager, think about your team and who maybe would be good in those opportunities that you're just not even thinking about, or you didn't even think to offer it to them. Like there, I could have taken people from Cincinnati to run the event as well. It's just things were happening in such a, a fast cascading uh, order. I was just trying to keep all of the work that had to be done in order to keep Organize 365 going, going, and any free time open for employees to be able to use for their families as they need it for the unexpected events. And so as the business owner, I know I'm the only person that could totally eliminate things like having a booth at a homeschool convention. So just reduce the complexity entirely. Don't pull the Organize 365 staff from Cincinnati, physically move them to South Carolina to run an event at an even greater expense. And then they don't get the work done they were supposed to get done in Cincinnati, leaving more burden on them to do more work. It was just easier to cancel the booth entirely than to, to add even more money to that event and take even more capacity out of the team. So that's what I was doing. But in hindsight, it was an awesome, you were fabulous at running the paper organizer retreat as I knew you would be, but it then is now like, okay, now Tanya could just run paper organizer retreats because she's done it. So if you're the employee and like chaos is raining around you, volunteer <laughs> and you might end up, you get to try things. You never have to do it again if you don't want to, but if you're good at it, it can be like a new thing that you do. Yeah. I love that. Um, I love that you offer all of us as you know, organized 365 team, the opportunity to try new things and be in different roles. And, you know, um, the conversation is always, what do you like to do? <laughs> yes. You know, how do you like to do it? Are you, you know, do you feel like you're that you're strong in that? What do you want to learn? What more do you want to, how do you want to grow yourself? Um, because we had talked about my speaking thing previously. Yeah. Uh, and so, I knew it was something I wanted to work on. You knew it was something I wanted to work on. So that's why it wasn't a big deal because we both kind of knew that it was gonna happen at some point anyway. And if we go back to the bookkeeping, I felt really guilty asking you to step into the financial role inside of the company because I knew you had just left a financial role and you were really excited about the teaching role inside of Organize 365. And here I was like, out of the blue, not going to have somebody to run the finances of the company. And I'm really, I think all business owners should be really protective of 
who has access to the finances in your company. I just, I really don't know any business owner that hasn't been embezzled from, honestly. <laughs> Everyone I know that's a business owner, somebody has stolen money from them. It's just kind of like what happens. And so I'm very protective of that, but also like, I'm not going to do it. We already know that's going to go badly. And secondly, it's basically a full-time job. Like I can't, I can't physically even do it. I couldn't do it if I wanted to do it. So when I got that resignation letter, I was like, okay, well, either Tanya's going to take this over or I'm hiring an outside firm. Like those were the only, only options. And so I asked you first, like, do you want to do this? And thank goodness you said yes for so many reasons. One, you're great at it. Two, this is hilarious. You guys, you're going to laugh at this. I had bought a four drawer file cabinet in January for stock pho photography because there is not good stock photography out there for, for files and file cabinets. So we bought it in January, did a full photo shoot. We have amazing photos from it. Then after the bookkeeper finished resigning, she brought in the paperwork that she had at her house and it filled it. First of all, I didn't know we had any of that paperwork for the company, which is on me. Like, how did I not think we had all of that paperwork? I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. And second, we now have a four drawer file cabinet, which you do have to have a file cabinet if you're a business owner, you do. But it all came in unorganized binders and it took someone in our office here a whole month to get it organized in a way that we can now um, pull the files when we need it and digitize whatever we needed. And then on the flip side, the, I mean, our, our, our numbers were always perfect, but the um, automation behind it, there wasn't any automation. And so what Tanya did for three or four months was just take everything from analog and make it it automatic. Now, you know, I'm all about analog, <laughs> but not with your business finances. Those definitely need to not be analog um, because you just, it's a lot harder to pay things in a more timely manner when you have to mail and, and do checks. So I'm very, very grateful that you stood into that. And now we have hired a firm to do our finances now that you have organized them and you could step back more into a teaching role. I say all of that because if you are a business owner or a manager and you have someone leave your team, whenever anyone leaves our team, I use that as an opportunity to move people around in the company, which I do like, I don't know, I'm playing checkers. And secondly, to clean up any systems or processes left over from that last person before you move to the new one. Had we moved directly from the bookkeeper to a accounting firm, it could have been done. It would have cost a lot of money because there was a lot of cleanup that needed to be done. And I would have not felt like I had a handle on the finances of the company. I feel like I have a handle on everything that is happening because you took it over, Tanya, and you got it all organized. And we included Stephanie in all those conversations. So now there are three of us who understand everything versus one person that was doing everything before. So I'm just going to publicly thank you so much for stepping into that and then stepping back into teaching like you are now. You are so welcome. So the other reason I wanted to have you on the podcast is um, because you then ended up in your own unexpected medical emergency and your mother-in-law is doing well now, correct? She is, yes. Yes. So we've talked in a couple of these podcast interviews about how our prior preparation makes it easier to go through these unexpected events. Like we are going to have unexpected medical events with all of our parents and ourselves and our kids and everybody, but you had already sold both houses and moved into one. What would this have looked like one year prior in North Carolina with two houses? Um, I think it just would have been a little more chaotic, uh, certainly. It, it Just with all of us being together already, the communication was already really uh, well figured out. Um, we were just making the most important decisions at the time. So it wasn't like we, um, it just felt while it was scary and stressful and all of that, um, it just felt like because we were already together, it was a little less, a little less chaotic. And this was not your mother. So it was your husband's mother. Um, what was your role while all this was going on? Like, how did you support and how, who took the lead and that kind of thing? Um, I, I was still working, so I had to still do all of my regular duties. Um, and my 
in-laws usually take care of my kids. So <laughs> it was trying to figure out like, you know, dropping off at school and picking up from school and, and doing all of those things while, you know, not interrupting my, my, my schedule that I already had. Um, luckily we did a lot of meal planning and things ahead of time. So we had some freezer meals that I could just pull out and that made it really easy to, um, you know, take up a lot of the feeding of the people <laughs> while everything was going on. Um, so that I think those are some of the things that I think of now that really helped that situation. And um, do you have any family or friends where you've moved to in Florida? No, it's just us. Okay. So that's what Virginia said. That's what Monique said, like relocating to these new places where you want to live, but you don't have any additional support. Um, so was there anybody who was able to support you? And what did that look like during that time? So my husband had just started a new job. Um, oh, jeez. Jeez. <laughs> not not to not to uh maybe like a month or so earlier um so he has a, a fairly flexible schedule um because he does outside sales so he was able to help with some of the driving things um and he can work some from home um in the afternoons so that was helpful um it was really just the two of us just kind of dividing and conquering the things that we needed to get done. Is there anything people could have done to support you during that time? Um, I don't, I don't think there's anything really extra that, because we just did the things that were most necessary. And, and really when, when you, mm -hmm are trying to like keep your head above water and and you know you're worried about family or friends or anything like that you just kind of like focus on the essentials and just leave the rest because it will be there later for you that's one of the great things about the work box and the sunday basket and all of the systems that we already had in place um because i didn't have to worry about really dropping anything that was important Great. Um, I know in Monique's podcast, now she, Zenon, was in Ukraine when her situation happened. Um, so she said that often, you know, people will say, how can I help? And we gave a whole long list of ways that you could just proactively say, I'm doing this. So like, I'm coming to clean your house. When would that be best? Like, I'm going to drop off food. When can I drop it off? Versus like, how can I help? Or what do you need? Um, if anybody could have done something for you at that time, can you think of anything that would have helped? Um, I think the food thing is always important. Like when, when anyone can, you know, when anyone can help relieve some of the, um, basic necessities, we already had people who were cleaning our house. So if if that wasn't the case, like that would be something that would be super helpful. Um, the meal thing is always helpful. Like anything that helps childcare, that's helpful. Like anything mm. that, that, you know, if the, the issue that we had was we're in a new place and we don't really, you know, we haven't been here long. We don't, we haven't made many friends because our kids, you know, we're only in the school for a short amount of time. So all of those, it was like the perfect storm where there was really nothing, you know, no one close by to help out. But um, I think those top three things, so childcare, mm -hmm. obviously, um, fe feeding food and, um, oh my goodness, cleaning, just the, you know, the basic things. Yeah, we didn't mention childcare because all of Monique's children are over the age of 22. So that is a good one. Um, childcare is a great one that we'll add that childcare to the list. Also, I was just thinking of that. So while she was in the hospital um, and, you know, we they have a cat. So we had to make sure that we were taking care of uh, the pets too. Luckily, she has a document on her computer that she has printed out for us before that just ha has all the details like when to feed her and when to do this and when to do that. So, um, so I mean, it's like the operations of of the cat too, <laughs> like how of the cat. Of the cat. <laughs> so, 
but the cat is obviously in the same house with you, right? It's one house, right? It is, but they have like their own little in-law area and that cat kind of, their cat stays, stays in there. there. She's older and she doesn't, she doesn't like kids. <laughs> But I mean, when my mother-in-law had to go to the hospital and was in the um, inpatient rehabilitation thing, when she broke her hip, that was six weeks. She had a cat mm -hmm. and, and you think, oh, it's a cat. Yeah, it's a cat, which is great because you can go every other day. Even if she thinks you went every day, I did not. We went every other day. Uh, the cat is fine. Cats are fine. Uh, if it's a dog, oh my gosh, you cannot go every other day. It's a dog. <laughs> you had like... These pets are a lot of work in addition to taking care of the person, in addition to taking care of the bills, in addition to like, like if you have pets and something happens to you, that it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time that you're adding to someone's schedule um, when they, if you are not in the home and they could take care of the pet while they're taking care of you in the home. So yeah, I think we definitely have to add pets on there. It's a, it's a big one. Um, I think that the fact that you had already proactively moved into a cohabitating situation instead of two separate houses, I would think that you and your husband are really happy you made that decision. We are, for sure. I'll speak <laughs> for him because he's not here. But yes, I think that, um, I think it was very helpful because uh, luckily she, you know, recovered quickly. Um, she did have to have another surgery 30 days later to fix what didn't get fixed the first time. Um, so there were, but but it it could have been a lot longer. And um, when I think back now, if it was a lot longer of a time period, it, it would have been a lot more difficult had we been in two separate houses, really. And, you know, your father-in-law, um, you've got to worry about them as well no matter what their age is, you know, so you'd be checking on the cat and checking on the father-in-law, checking on the mother-in-law, and then you've got your own kids and you both have your own jobs and you have your house and it would be their house. Like it's much easier, I would think, to go knock on the door right next to the kitchen than to go to a completely separate house and say, hey dad, anything else you need before we go to bed? You know, have you had an update from mom? That kind of a thing versus like making the phone call or driving over there and also easier to feed him if it's right off the kitchen and feeding the kids, you feed him, then go over and like um, just the logistics of it. The other thing um, that maybe I hadn't really thought of until recently, but um, just being in close proximity and being able to like see how she's recovering, mm -hmm. hear things and just be observant of, you know, if, if there was a problem again, um, just kind of knowing like how the recovery has been and if there's any, you know, declines or anything like that, like just being right there, I always like to be present. And so just being able to really observe that I think is important if you can be. Well, I, I have said that to Greg also, he's like, in, you know, our daughter obviously would want to move out. Like who doesn't want to move out? She doesn't want to stay in the house forever. And I'm like trying to bide my time. I'm like, maybe when he goes to kindergarten, you know, I hope you get a place. Um, so, and I say to Greg, you know, it's going to be so, so quiet when Grayson isn't living here, but I really love having eyes on that baby every day and Abby every day. Like, I mean, parenting is exhausting and a toddler, like he's two and he definitely tests his boundaries and he's like, you know, look right at you and then do the thing, you know? And if you're a parent, you know, when that has happened and you have lost it <laughs> and like, and Abby's a single mom, like when she's not living with us and having to deal with that all on her own without being able to come upstairs and say, here, can you take the monitor? I need to go. I need a break or whatever. Like I like having eyes on her and the baby and just kind of seeing like, you know, is this the time where I go, no, you can handle this and make her like grow in her parenting muscles? Or, or is this the time where I go, you know, what? as a matter of fact, how about if you just, I'll just keep them all night, you know, like, how about if I just keep this one for a little bit for you? And how about if you like, go do whatever you want to do? And I don't even care what it is. Um, because you, she needs that. She needs that support. And if she's not in our house, it's harder to tell that by text or phone calls, or they don't even call and you, you don't know. And so, 
I really enjoy having a multi-generation household. I, I really do. And we've been really good at, you know, the top floor is ours and the basement is Abby's and we meet in the middle. And I mean, I only go in the basement if I'm getting a baby out of a crib or putting them in one. And she will come upstairs on occasion, just like you would expect a child to come to your house on occasion. So we've been really good at having those boundaries where it is kind of like two different living situations. Have you, now that you've kind of settled in, what are you guys finding is, is happening for you? We do kind of the same thing. So we have like a communal area. Um, and then my in-laws have a, their bedroom, a bathroom, and then um, what they call their den. So they have like their own little area that they can go to, to kind of get away from the rest of the house if they want to, um, which is, it has been, and, and I try and be mindful of that and protective of that for them. Um, it's a little difficult when you have kids who are nine and, but I'm trying to train them, help them to see like that is grandma and grandpa's space and you guys have to, you know, knock when you go in there and, you know, wait to be invited and all of those things, because it's important when you do have yep. you know, two, two families living together, um, you know, we're all one family, but, but it's a little bit different when it's multi-generational. Yeah. You want to be protective of everyone's spaces. And I think that's important. Yeah. I mean, and Abby will come upstairs to ask me a question. I'll be in school. She'll realize I'm in school and Grayson's like, oh, we get to play. And she's like, nope, I'm downstairs. And he's like, not happy, but he's like, okay, I don't get to go up there at that time. So he recognizes as well. I think that the more conversations we can have like this, the better, because there are a lot of families who are doing multi-generational living. And the more that we normalize it and talk about, you know, I mean, everybody has their own way of doing it. I think that how everybody used to live back in the day, everybody didn't have their own house. So I just see a lot of that coming back. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for sharing your story. We're glad that your mother-in-law is okay. Really enjoyed having the time with you in South Carolina. I know all of the paper organizing retreat attendees and certified organizers did as well. So if you're wondering why all the paper organizing retreats are now in Cincinnati, now you know, like it's just the logistics of traveling all over the United States and moving organized 365 team members. It just, it was a lot. It was a lot. And we are, we are grateful that every, everything turned out okay, but for our team capacity in order to do more paper organizer retreats, we'll just be having them in Cincinnati versus all over the place. Of course, you know, the certified organizers, they have virtual and in-person paper organizing retreats all over the United States. So you can go to the Organize 365 directory to learn more about that. Anything else you want to say before we close out, Tanya? I've just had a great time talking with you, Lisa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next in this series will be the podcast with Virginia, which I alluded to today. So you can hear about that one coming next week. Thank you so much.